It's Sunday night and it's time I tell you what we learned from this weekend in the championship. Let's not mess about. Let's go. As always, if you do find value from the content, please make sure you leave a like and subscribe. We're getting closer to 10,000 subscribers. It's free to do that, so that would be amazing if you could do so. And of course, in the comments down below, let me know how you reflect on your team's weekend performance. Let's go to Fratton Park as Portsmouth hosted Oxford United. Of course, it finishes Portsmouth 1, Oxford United 1, the XG for the home side, 0.96. I think the biggest thing we learned about Portsmouth yesterday is that there was a clear improvement between boxes, but still a lack of bite in the final third and inconsistent cohesion defensively. And that still feels like the letdown. Now, visualising those improvements between boxes is quite tricky because the only way you can truly do that is watch the game. But this graph does show us the increase in control Pompey had on Saturday. You only had to watch one Pompey game last season to see how much their identity was about them having the ball obviously in a new league and a higher division replicating that all of the time is very very tricky but I don't think it's a coincidence that things look slightly smoother in build-up when Pompey had larger spells of control. Now, John Messina's side currently ranked 20th for average possession and 21st for accurate passes per 90. Up until this point, it's clearly been an issue and the reason why it's still taking us time to work out what a John Messino pompey championship team looks like. Stylistically, the similarities have been quite rare. Now, the fallout to this from a Portsmouth point of view will be so mixed. I am 100% on board with that because it's nine games played, it's zero wins, it's a very, very tough period. But I've watched the game back and Pompey missed a handful of big chances. I'll put some examples of those on the screen now. We can spin that another way and say, well, that's an improvement because creativity and the quality of chances being created just hasn't been there in the last couple of weeks. So that is an improvement. But there were opportunities and that's important to say. It's not a good run and all of that game wasn't great it was scrappy at points it really was but there were chances for Pompey to score and Oxford but I think Pompey edged Oxford when it comes to chances created it didn't take long to see Pompey's wide threat was extremely left-sided on Saturday to the point where they didn't even really play with a right winger at all as the passing network shows us there was practically nobody consistently occupying that part of the pitch if Pompey wanted to use width in the game it was always going to be through Josh Murphy on that left-hand side in fact he actually touched the ball the most out of all the attackers on the pitch with the second most involvements inside the opposition box during the afternoon now two things I always come back to when trying to understand the team's current goal scoring work and output is the areas in which they're touching the ball and the positions in which they are shooting. So far this season, Pompey sit 23rd for touches inside the opposition box, averaging just 16.3 touches per 90. In the game yesterday, though, they racked up 35. I know it's Oxford and the games leading up to that point have been slightly trickier, but it's a significant improvement. Even if the goals aren't free flowing now, you'd much rather be in those positions than not. I also love a shot map, and this one is the most encouraging yet from a Pompey point of view, not just because of the amount of efforts, but the mix of shots from inside and outside the box. I understand the points tally and the lack of a win is a severe burden. It would be for any supporter of a football team. But after watching that game back with slightly less yellow tinted glasses, I must add, that Pompey performance wasn't that bad. It, it didn't feel that bad. The reason why it feels bad is because it couldn't be backed up with sufficient points before and now the weight still goes on. But there were signs. And if anything, Pompey, you've been lacking signs, especially on Wednesday night. There were some at Fratton Park on Saturday. As for Oxford, their XG is 1.13. I think the biggest thing we learned about them is they're continuing to see success in using the wider squad to impact games. In back-to-back -back games now, Des Buckingham has made a substitution that has directly led to an equalising goal involvement. At Luton, it was Carl Edwards who allowed Oxford to play with double width, stretch the game and create the goal that Ruben converted. Yesterday, it was Louis Sibley, a player that has been, I think, out in the cold but looked quite desperate to make an impact after limited opportunities and he came on and did just that. A squad game as well as a team game and that's so positive from an Oxford point of view back-to-back -back comeback points as well it's all right it's a good point for Oxford Norwich 4, Hull City nil. the XG for Norwich, the winning side, 3.78. The biggest thing we learned about them is that Hofball is in full swing and right now it can't be stopped. It was a phenomenal display. When Hofthorpe was appointed at Norwich, we all knew there was going to be a heavy stylistic change. It was going to take time, but in recent weeks, things look more than encouraging. I spoke on a recent roundup about purposeful use of the ball 
which strikes me as the biggest difference between Norwich in recent years and what we're seeing right now. The height of the spikes is where Norwich looks so dangerous, and you can see that when looking at the graph. They came forward with a threat every single time. At no point was it passive. It was all about pace of the build-up and intense work in regaining hold of the ball. It was slick, it was smooth, it was attractive, and most importantly, it had output. Norwich created six big chances during the 90 minutes, accumulating the highest expected goals of the weekend across the championship. It was very literally a case of every time they came forward, they looked like scoring. On the screen now are nine screenshots that show Norwich in a dangerous position. That's right, there's nine, so keep watching. There's a few to get through. Some were converted and some weren't, but the sheer amount is crazy and suggests that 4-0 probably flatters Hull. Hull was Hull were flattered in a 4-0 defeat. That just shows you how Norwich attacked and attacked time and time again. Norwich's threat in transition was mouthwatching. The idea was to press aggressively in a mid-block and then search for the willing runners in behind. This screenshot shows the intense middle squeeze. The next image is science through on goal four seconds later. We'll come to how Hull made this much easier than it needed to be because they did. But let's not take anything away from the execution of a well-thought-out game plan. Now, when you play this way, it's always made much easier when you've got somebody who is technically gifted, a creator, somebody that can find a pass instinctively. Introducing Nunes, the boy is a joke. The fact he's still playing in the championship is frightening. The roaming creator scored, committed four key passes, eight passes into the final third, whilst also creating four chances too. He did everything. He was incredible. And I'll say it again, he's playing in the championship. You better lock him in a cage. That's not legal, but metaphorically lock him in a cage during January because there will be suitors. He is pivotal in this Norwich setup right now and has taken this new role under Hoff like a duck to water. I'll say it now, player of the season contender if he stays in the championship. I know it's early, but God, he's impressive. And if they carry on playing like this as well, he'll be a key cog because he was one hell of a key cog yesterday. Now, I couldn't dissect this Norwich performance without mentioning a certain Kellen Fisher. This man looks beyond exciting and is playing such a dynamic role. Now, fullbacks in vert, it's 2024, people. Let's get with the times. But at such a young age, we're seeing a footballer that can do so, so much. Is he technically good enough? Absolutely. Is he defensively good enough? Well, when he's called upon, totally. His heat map from the game yesterday is scary. We're talking about a right back. He covers so many different areas of the pitch. Thorup loves flexibility as a team, but also individually as well. And fluidity. Fisher is his man. He's keeping Jack Stacey out of the side. And right now, Jack Stacey doesn't have too much to moan about, I don't think, because he is a joke. He's playing so, so well in this new dynamic inverted role, but importantly able to defend incredibly 1v1. He's got a real balance, a fantastic balance indeed. Whole City, their XG 0.84. A quick word on them. Simply, why do they persist with the high line? It was naive and the desire to invite pressure inside their own box. It felt really, really silly. It was clear that Norwich wanted to play with pace in behind. So leaving such a large amount of space between the defenders and a goalkeeper was a recipe for disaster. And it happened early and they refused to change. Adapt, make a change. I know working with strong principles is what managers are all about these days. But drop the ego and look at your team is being faced with. Whole fans should be fuming with the lack of tactical changes during the onslaught because it just happened time and time again. They did not learn. And like I said earlier, a 4-0 defeat actually flatters the away team. Look, they've come into this match with some fantastic form. This one, it felt naive and they did not learn their lessons and they refused to change. Sunderland 2, Leeds 2 was the final score on Friday night. Let's start with Sunderland. They're actually 1.89. I think everybody's watched the game. So running through the goals and the obvious mistake at the end, it feels a bit pointless. I wanted to sort of do something a little bit different and speak about something that Reggie said in his post-match interview because it was intriguing. Now, this is a screenshot when Sunderland went 1-0 up. It's a shape we've not seen them play once this season. Since Reggie has come in, it's been a 4-3-3 with the ball and a 4-4-2 press without it. But at the moment... 
when this screenshot is taken, Daniel is dropping into play as a third centre-back. And Reggie mentioned this and mentioned the switch. It felt like the intention was to simply add another defensive body into that back line and then allow the full-backs to stay tighter to their wide men because you could stretch that back line out. The issue being, it forced Sunderland extremely deep and when they did regain the ball, there was a lack of bodies able to keep hold of it and turn over effectively by inviting pressure leads, played much higher and then inevitably scored. I could have told you none of that information and just shown you this graph because I think it's pretty clear when Leeds found their feet in that first half and at that moment Reggie's plan to stifle the threat just wasn't really working. I don't think we can avoid the conversation for much longer. Chris Rigg, the boy, is 17 years old. The conversation has gone on for quite a few weeks now, and so it should, because he is a phenomenal young talent. Now, people will jump to the goals and the impressive output, but this lad is so much more than that, to the point where I don't think anybody really knows what type of player he will become. And that's fine, because he's so young and he's so good anyway. From the composed back heel, driving into the box to cause havoc, the creativity, he's a joy to watch, simply because... You have no idea what he's going to do next. Now, these screenshots aren't actually from this game, but it does show us the sheer variety of his attributes on display. With no fear in the world, Chris Rigg pounces on a loose touch and starts a breakaway in seconds. Now, on reflection, the touch is a poor one, but if you watch it back, Chris Rigg has already made that decision to pull the trigger before the player even touches the ball. Now, that is instinct. It's split-second decision-making that is already coming natural to somebody three years younger than me. That's frightening. I felt that was Chris Rigg in a nutshell. Fearless, so intelligent and a scarily all-rounded footballer. How far can he go? Let me know in the comments down below. What is the level that Chris Rigg can get to? Because right now, that ceiling looks extremely high. As for Leeds United, their XG 2.32. Something I learned about Leeds this weekend is Tanaka and Rothwell could be a strong midfield alternative. Now, all the focus will be on the nightmare moment in the final seconds of the game. And I get that. It was a dreadful mistake. And it was probably the worst goalkeeping error I've seen in my life. It was just comically bad but there were positives and some real shining lights to be honest Tanaka won 100% of his tackles and was involved in five defensive actions across the 90 minutes whilst Rothwell the slightly more ball playing type of the two finished the game with a 90% pass accuracy four passes into the final third and a single chance created injuries have struck Leeds hard in midfield but if those two can play like they did on Friday night and step up like they did on Friday night things could be okay it doesn't feel like a good point for Leeds but they probably would have taken a point before a ball was kicked, not thrown in. Sorry, Leeds.